I entered a Pokemon TCG tournament with a wild rogue deck. Now, in many respects, playing a rogue deck is bad in a tournament, at least if you're trying to win. This is because most competitive tournaments are going to be filled with people playing the best decks in format as, well, because they're the best decks. However, sometimes all it takes is a freshly cooked deck to find its time to shine and play perfectly into the meta. So let's start where all Pokemon TCG tournaments begin with a deck of 60 cards. Now, this tournament was a league challenge. And whilst being an officially sanctioned competitive tournament, they don't have the highest of stakes. So you'd think choosing a deck wouldn't be too stressful. However, this tournament was different. As it was not only the first tournament in a new format, but it was also the first tournament of the official competitive 2025 season, which would be one of the most difficult and cutthroat competitive seasons to date. So everyone was going to be on edge about choosing their decks to start off the season. And I was going through the same motions. You see, Twilight Masquerade bought a whole bunch of new cards to the TCG of which drastically changed how some decks function and also added a bunch of new archetypes to the meta as well. Now, up to this point, I've been playing mostly control, but due to the competitive season break on the lead up to Worlds, I barely played any control in this new format. As any time that I was playing the TCG, I was dedicating that to playing the following Shrouded Fable format as I was practicing for my next major tournament, the Pokemon World Championships. But this meant that I couldn't pick control as my comfort pick for this tournament as I wasn't really familiar what people were playing in their decks and control relies heavily on knowing what card counts are in all of the meta relevant decks. So here's me at square one and no idea what people would be playing. And I only have a few days until the tournament. So I'm feeling super lost. And I think I'm just gonna play a random concoction of control and just hope that we wing it on the day. But then out of nowhere on my X feed pops up a tweet from another TCG player, Makani Tran. Makani has in recent times been known for placing really, really well at tournaments with his Arceus V-Star decks. And today was no different. He managed to place top 8 at a 1k tournament with a crazy arc pile. Now this was wild to me, as I played a lot of arc in the previous season. However, after placing top 32 at my last regionals, I immediately deconstructed the deck, as it looked like it was never going to survive the upcoming meta shifts. So to see another arc deck placing at a tournament was awesome. Looking at Makani's list, it felt strong. It used Legacy Energy as its A spec, which allowed you to skew the prize trade, which was something that most Arc decks really struggled with before. It also included Blood Moon Ursa Luna, the strongest card from Twilight Masquerade, which also had great synergy with cards in the deck like Legacy Energy, Sharon's Care, and Jet Energy. Jamming Towers were also the stadium of choice, perfect for denying Forest Seal Stones and TM Evolutions early game, and being able to remove effects from things like Bravery Charm, which can really, really help you in the Guardball matchup. To top it off, it played Radiant Serena which is a crazy card as it actually really helps you to survive things like Phantom Dive from Dragapult as well as getting hit by Monkey Dory's Adrenobrain. The deck looked awesome and I was super keen to try it. So thanks to randomly eyeballing a deck online, my stress was relieved and now I felt ready for game day. The event comes around and it's time to play. First round of the tournament, we get paired up into Daniel, and he's playing Reggie Drago. Sadly, I wasn't able to get the camera set up in time, so he missed my first turn. But I did manage to win the dice roll, and we're going first, which gives us a fantastic chance in this matchup. I start by benching an Arceus, as well as getting an energy attached, and playing a Bidoof down. This is fantastic, as I know Daniel's not going to be able to attack me on his first turn. Then over to Daniel, he has a pretty solid setup. He gets a Reggie Drago V down into play, which is really good. And luckily for me, he does bench a Mew EX. Now, this is fantastic for me, as it affects my prize race dramatically. Sometimes in this matchup, you'll go behind due to only being able to two hit Reggie Dragos and Tillmask Ogre Ponds with Arceus V. So giving me an out to knock out a two prizer on my second turn is fantastic for my prize race. So coming back over to me, I evolve my active Arceus V and a B barrel, as well as thin out a couple of cards to get another Arceus V. B barrel for five cards to try and find the boss's orders and double turbo. Sadly, we don't hit it, so we can just use a nest ball to get a Bidoof. We V star for our double turbo energy to attach, and then we boss up that Mew EX to get a knockout, which is fantastic for us. Moving back over to Daniel, he's got a Reggie Drago V star, so he uses that legacy star ability to try and set up his board a little bit better. He does manage to get a fire type energy, which is desperately going to as those are really hard to find out of the deck. But sadly, he's not able to get an attack off, which means that I can pretty much steamroll here into the lead. Actually able to play Squabber because I can protect it with Mist Energy. Play down an Eerie and manage to snipe out some crucial resources from Daniel's hand. Keep going through my hand a little bit with Squabbit and B-Barrel. Get me in a state where I can have a good follow-up next turn. And then I swing into Reggie Drago V-Star with Trinity Nova, which means I'll be able to knock it out the following turn. Daniel realizes he's going to be a little bit too far behind, so he just scoops it up to go to the next game. 
Going into game two, Daniel correctly elects to go first. He starts out with a Reggie Drago V, and then he also manages to find that elusive fire type energy to attach turn one, which is awesome for him. And then he passes it back over to me. I've got a 70 HP Bidoof in my active, as well as a jet energy in my hand. So I choose to discard my 60 HP Bidoof off of my Ultra Ball, as it can be Phantom Dive, Sniped, and KO'd immediately. And with my Ultra Ball, I get a Arceus V, and then use my jet energy to shoot it into the active. I bench my Radiant Serena, as if he does Phantom Dive, I can heal 20 damage off my bench B-Doof, which means that I won't lose my B-Barrel the following turn to a secondary Phantom Dive. Sadly, that leaves me with one card in hand, which is a Super Rod, which is an absolutely dead card for the following turn. So unless my top deck is awesome, this is definitely going to be a scoop up go next angle. Moving over to Daniel, he does set up his board well enough that he is able to get a attack off with the Reggie Drago V, which doing enough damage, even with the elegant heal from Radiant Serena, is going to be enough for my Arceus V to survive next turn. So for my next top deck, I get a fighting type energy, which is not going to be enough for me to be able to stay in this game. So I just decide to scoop it up and have the much better chance at starting going first the following game. For our final game, I'm going first, and I get a fantastic first hand. I get an Arceus V in the active, and I also get two mulligans to help me out a little bit extra. My first board state is amazing, with two Bidoofs benched, as well as an Arceus V and a double turbo for my turn. And my hand for the following turn is cracked as well, so I'm looking pretty safe overall. For Daniel's turn, he has to immediately use a Professor's Research, getting rid of a lot of crucial resources just to find that turn one Reggie Drago, but he does get the fire energy attached, and he uses Grasping Draw to finish his turn. Going into my next turn, I've got pretty much everything that I need. I have a Arceus V as well as a B-Barrel, and my aim for this turn is just to draw through a bunch of cards in my deck to hopefully save that V-Star for when I actually really need it. If you can save the V-Star for as long as possible, it gives you an amazing advantage throughout the rest of the game. So of my second B-Barrel, I actually find the boss's orders, which I really wanted to hit that Reggie Drago V to give me KO on it next turn. This next turn for Daniel is crucial. The pressure is on and he manages to load up a couple of things onto the Reggie Drago V-Star, but he makes a huge misplay in not using Reggie Drago's Legacy Star. This means that he has no follow-up attackers for the next turn, which by using Legacy Star would have given him much stronger outs to getting a second Reggie Drago V established. Instead, he just swings into me for 140 damage. And back over to me, I still have the ability to draw through a bunch of cards and I just finish off the turn by going for a Trinity Nova in to knock out the Reggie Drago V Star. Daniel's board's now looking really weak, but he does have a Reggie Drago V that he is able to put into play, and he just bosses up my B-Barrel to try and stall it out, and then draws with Cleffa's Grasping Draw to end the turn. Now, luckily for me, I did save that V-Star, which means after I whiff my switching out on my B-Barrel draws, I'm actually just able to go into my deck and grab a switch to pull my Arceus V-Star into the active, which has full HP. And then I'm also able to grab a Boss's Orders, which will allow me to target down the Reggie Drago V that is currently on the bench. Making my prize map look super good, as he's most likely going to be forced to just attack with this Reggie Drago later on in the game. Daniel's next turn, he's finally able to establish a better board state. But then all he can do is switch into Cleffa, and then also boss stall up yet another one of my B-Barrels on the bench. And Grasping Draw to finish his turn. He's got a long way to come back into this game. Back over to me, I have a really good play where I can Charon Scare up my damage Arceus, which enables me to get access to my double turbo energy just to retreat the B-Barrel. And then I just start swinging into the Cleffa. It's not going to help me out of my prize race at all, but it is it's just really good to have a full HP Arceus V-Star in the active, just to allow me to keep the pressure on. Heading into Daniel's next turn, he's able to find a fire type energy to then put onto the Reggie Drago V, and then after researching, he's able to get access to the Reggie Drago V-Star as well, which he's now able to swing with using Raging Bolt, but sadly he does discard the energy off his backup Reggie Drago V, so once I knock out this Reggie Drago V-Star in the active, he now no longer has a backup attacker once again, and only one energy switch available in play, and with that he just scoops it up and his final boss is also in the prize cards so he wasn't even going to be able to stall out for the rest of the game so with that we take round number one Round two, we get paired up into David, and he is playing Charizard, but I have a fantastic tech for this matchup. He starts out by just benching a Pidgey and then passing over to me. I managed to top deck an Arceus V, which I play down onto the board. I also have Buddy Buddy Poffin, which I used to go grab a single Bidoof, as I want my board to be really, really tight for this entire game, as I'm going to use my tech, Cornerstone Ogre Pond, as soon as possible. Then back over to David, he plays down an Iono, and it gives me a gas hand for the next turn, and he's forced to Insta-Charge. I play down the Nest Ball to get the Cornerstone Ogre 
Trigger Pond. David picks it up to have a look and he is now in shambles. I now stash and then draw with B-Barrel to get a better hand. And then I use my V-Star to grab a Jet Energy and boss up the Pidgey to really disrupt David's draw for the rest of the game. Now that I know that I'm going to be so far ahead, I decide to play a wider board state where I think I can just outpace David instead of having to just rely on the Cornerstone Ogre Pond. To knocking out the Pidgey, David top decks the Pidgeot EX and then he scoops up and goes next. For me starting off, I start off with the Cornerstone Ogre Pond. He gets down a couple of Pokemon onto his bench and then Insta charges back over to me. I attach a double turbo energy to Cornerstone Ogre Pond, get my bench set up with an Arceus V and then I play down an Eerie. David throws his cards. He is not happy. We look at his hand and he's got two rare candies in there and everything else is a dead card. So we get rid of the two rare candies. Pass it over to David, and from here, I would just be able to evolve and go crazy with the Cornerstone Ogre Pond and take out his entire board, so he just scoops it up, and that is probably the fastest game that I've played in a competitive tournament, lasting around about 8 minutes. So after round 2, we're starting at 2 and 0. Oh. Around three, we get paired up into Blake, and he's playing Ancient Box. Now, this is a very linear matchup where all I can really do is play Cheren's Care and use my Legacy Energy in my deck to hopefully skew the prize trade enough that I'll be able to steamroll ahead. Because I'm playing two prizes, and he's playing all single prizes, it means that I'm going to have to take individual knockouts before he gets the chance to take all six of his prize cards. When the dice roll, and I get to go first, I start up with a Arceus V in the active, which is fantastic. I bench a Bidoof and get my energy attached, which is pretty much all I need to do in this matchup. Over to Blake, he gets a board established, which is pretty good. He does play an Explorer's Guidance, which means that he's not going to be able to attack his first turn. Now, something to be careful about is he does attach the Ancient Booster Energy Capsule. This gives him enough HP that he won't be able to get knocked out in one shot by Arceus V-Star with a double turbo attached, which means that I have to dig to find one of my three jamming towers. So he attaches the Ancient Booster Capsule and passes over to me. I bench down a Bidoof. I also evolve into a B-Barrel and my Arceus V-Star. Attach the double turbo. I do notice that I prized my Squavit. So I decide to go very hard on the B-Barrels on the bench, playing down another Bidoof. And to guarantee me the best chance at starting this game, I use Starbirth. To go get me a Nest Ball for Arceus V. And then also get a Jamming Tower to make sure that I can knock out this Roaring Moon in one shot. Giving me an early lead which I desperately need. Blake begins by getting a Sada into play. And he gets some fantastic Pokestop hits. Now early in the game, Baby Roaring Moon doesn't hit for too much damage. So after he hits me once, I really want to try and find that Charon's Care. However, without a Squavit, it's going to be super hard. I attach a Legacy Energy to my Arceus V-Star. And then I'm forced to play Iono as I can't draw any additional cards. Of my Iono, I do find a Arceus V-Star which... I can use to evolve as well as a B barrel to evolve another one of my bench B doofs. And I can progress my board by getting a jamming tower down into play to bump his Hokey Stop. Bench another Arceus V, which I'm able to use Trinity Nova to knock out his Roaring Moon and attach more energy onto. Blake now already has a Roaring Moon with two energy on it, so he can afford to use Explorer's Guidance to try and build up his ancient cards in his discard pile. And then knocks out my active Arceus V-Star with Vengeance Fletching. Now due to Legacy Star being on this Pokemon, he does only take one single prize card, which in this matchup is crucial. Back over to me, it's pretty streamlined for all my turns. I can just draw with B-Barrel to thin some cards out of my deck, and I just take out my third prize card on one of his Roaring Moons. From here, I'm one turn behind on the prize race, so I just need to hope that he misses one turn later in the game. I continue my game plan, filling up my board with random junk, and just disrupting him as much as possible, before taking yet another knockout on a Roaring Moon. Blake thins his deck down really, really low, and is able to continue drawing cards and attaching energy with Professor Sada. Off his three cards, he's actually very lucky to draw into the Roaring Moon and an energy, to give himself a really good chance at having a follow-up attacker to win this game next turn. So it's over to me, and I have to really pray that this Arceus does not get knocked out this next turn by a Roaring Moon. I thin my deck as much as possible, as I'm really trying to look for my one of Eerie that's left in deck. After using two of my industrious incisors, I only have one card left to draw. Off my last B-Barrel, I managed to find my one-off Eerie with around about five cards left in deck. This is awesome as he's got a superior energy retrieval, which would have given him the attack next turn. And I'm able to snap that right out of his hand. Blake promotes the Roaring Moon and is sadly not able to get another attack off for the rest of the game. So he just has to scoop it up. Into game two, I start out with the Arceus V in the active. He elects to go first and doesn't get any energies attached to his Pokemon. I get enough of a board set up that I'll be feeling pretty fine into the rest of the game and an energy attached for my first turn. I play down Eerie to get rid of whatever resources he has left in his hand. And Blake just starts flicking through his deck to see when he would possibly get another out to win. And it doesn't happen for a long time. So he just scoops it up and that is game three. Tied up at 3-0. and oh.
Our final round, we get paired up against Jake, and he's playing Roaring Moon. Now, originally, this was one of the worst matchups for Arceus V-Star. However, with the introduction of Mist Energy, you actually have a pretty good chance of beating this deck. So we get to roll the dice, and I win the dice roll, and I get to go first. But sadly, my hand is absolutely garbage. Even with one mulligan from Jake, I start out with the Serena. And all I have to do here is bench a Spirit Tomb and attach a double turbo energy to Radiant Serena. Jake has a pretty decent start to his turn, getting a Pokey Stop to help him draw some cards. But in the end, he's just forced to start to the active Flutter main and attach for turn, which means that I might actually have a chance of staying in this game for a little while longer. Back over to me, I managed to top deck a Iona, which is fantastic as it means that I actually can get some cards in my hand. And I managed to find one Arceus V as well as a Legacy Energy to attach to it. I have to hit the Pokestop because I desperately need a better board setup. And sadly, off my Pokestop, I hit a Mist Energy as well as a Bidoof and a Squabber, which hurts so much. And in the end, I just have to pass it back over to Jake. Now, Jake finally gets a Roaring Moon EX off of the Iono. He's able to Luminion for a Professor Sada to continue attaching energy to his board. Then he takes the KO of my active Spirit Tomb with Fluttermane. Now, it's always interesting to remember here is I can push up this Arceus and evolve it straight into an Arceus V-Star. However, because Fluttermane is in the active for Jake, it will stop my Star Birth ability. So it forces me to push up my Radiant Serena, but it's got a DTE, so I can just retreat it. Well, I Ultra Ball finally for my Arceus V-Star. And because my hand is still abysmal, I have to hit the Pokestop once again. But I do actually get a Nest Ball to find another Arceus V, which is amazing. Now, here's where I sadly forget the board state. And as I use Star Birth off my Arceus V start, I actually grab a Switch. Despite me already having a double turbo energy, which throughout the entire turn, I was planning just to grab a boss's orders to bring up the Roaring Moon, just to hit it for a little bit of damage. So it's within KO range. But yeah, I forget that there's a double turbo energy on the Serena. I don't check my own board. Grab a Switch and then grab an additional double turbo energy. And then I finish up with a Iono, which does give me an out to my third Arceus V. But disappointingly, I'm only going to have to take a one prize knockout here on the Fluttermane in the active, which does ruin my prize mapping a little bit. Jake's turn here, he does manage to get a Darkrai into play. And he's also able to find some Dark Patches. By using the Switch card, he can go into Roaring Moon EX. And then he actually decides to use Calamity Storm here to just sprinkle some damage onto my Arceus Vista. Back over to me, I find a boss's orders off the top of the deck. And I just use it to knock out the Luminion, just so I can get two prize cards. As at this point, my game plan is probably just to take one additional knockout on another Pokemon, then close the game with a Blood Moon Ursa Luna EX knockout on Roaring Moon EX. But Jake certainly does find that Prime Catcher, which is allowing him to bring up the Arceus V into the active. And this time he does use Frenzy Gouging just to take the KO, which I think is more than fine, as it does give me the knockout on this active Roaring Moon next turn, so I'd only need to find a boss's orders to have game on the following turn. Jake starts off with Greninja in the active. He realizes that he does not have any outs to be able to take a knockout this turn, or even stall out as I have a boss's orders in hand so he just scoops it up moving on to game two jake elects to go second and i actually have a better start getting an arceus into play which is always fantastic and straight off the rip i hit a buddy poffin as well to get me a bidoof and a squab plus additionally i have a double turbo energy which i can attach to my arceus on the bench as i know roaring moon can do some insane damage to my arceus v's in their first turn jake begins to get a decent board he gets a sada which he plays down to attach one of his energies to Roaring Moon. And then he also benches the Iron Bundle, which he then uses his Hyper Blower ability to gust up one of my bench Pokemon. Now, this is where I make a grave miscalculation. I assume because he just used Sada on the active Roaring Moon, there's going to be no way for him to be able to attach any more energy to actually attack this turn. And he would only have one manual attach for his turn. So I feel super safe just dropping this Arceus V into the active, meaning that I won't have to get a switch off of my V-Star next turn. And then Jake starts to combo some cards together. He gets a Nest Ball to grab another Roaring Moon and puts it onto the bench and dark patches onto it. Then he pulls out the energy switch, which is a card that I completely forgot about potentially being in this deck. I saw water energies in game one, but not a single energy switch. But because I haven't seen water energies in a Roaring Moon deck for around about six months, I completely forgot about this card. Which means that now I feel like I pretty much sold this entire game as he's just able to use Squawk ability to discard his entire hand. He finds a Pokestop and then just Calamity Storms my only Arceus with energy. And now I'm in a bit of a tough spot. Lucky I do have Mist Energy in my hand, which means that if I can evolve into an Arceus V-Star, this turn, my Arceus V-Star will be protected on the bench from being gusted up and then getting hit with Frenzied Gouging. I play down on Iono and I luckily get another Nest Ball so I can grab a backup attacker with the Arceus V. Sadly, the rest of my hand is terrible and I don't have a single out to get the V-Star into play. So I just have to pass it over to Jake and hope that he isn't able to do anything too detrimental this turn. But Jake here is actually able to go crazy. He manages to find a Luminion to then grab 
a boss's orders, and here I think the game is over. But I don't know whether Jake just didn't read Mist Energy properly, but he plays down a stadium and then uses boss's orders to bring up my Arceus V, which doesn't have any energy attached to it. If he had a boss up my Arceus with a Mist Energy, I would have scooped up the game right there and then. But now I actually have a chance to attack this following turn. On my turn, I chucked down my Irono straight away, leaving Jake with two cards in hand while I get to draw a fresh six. I find another Bidoof as well as an Ultra Ball so I can finally get an Arceus V-Star into my act. I use my V-Star to get a double turbo energy so I can start attacking as well as a B-Barrel so I can use my Nest Dash and then start drawing some cards. Now here I play a bit of a risky game where I assume that he won't be able to find a Gust off of the two cards that he has in hand because his deck is so huge. So I play down an Arceus V just to give me the potential out to Charon's Care so that he will not be able to use Calamity Storm on me twice. Over to Jake, he really can't do anything much. He uses Power Pad, and then he just has to swing into me for 100 damage with Calamity Storm. And I just find the other Arceus V-Star, and then just start drawing some more cards. I thin through my deck in order to find the Blood Moon Ursaluna EX that I'm definitely going to be getting into the mix soon as possible. Then I take the knockout on Roaring Moon EX. Jake draws the turn, uses a Dark Patch, and then just passes it back to me. Now, after last turn, I know Jake's got nothing going on in that hand. So I feel like I'm in a super comfortable spot. I bench down my Blood Moon Ursaluna that I got last turn. And then I start searching with Nest Dash and B-Barrel. Off B-Barrel, I actually find Charon's Care and two boss's orders. Which is great as I can pick up this damaged Arceus in the active with Charon's Care and then re-establish with the Mist Energy attached to keep myself out of range of getting KO'd once again. I re-establish Arc as I already lose to a boss regardless. And then I just swing in to knock out the active Greninja, which is going to hurt Jake's draw even more. He's forced, he's forced to go in with his Roaring Moon EX, and he proceeds to find a Switch card to help him stall yet again for another turn. Now for my following turn, I already have Boss to bring out the Roaring Moon EX, and Jake currently only has one card in hand. After using Squabbit and b Brout to filter through my hand, I managed to find my Legacy Energy, which allows me to bring up Blood Moon Ursaluna into the active and take the one-hit KO on his Roaring Moon. And to make matters worse, Jake top decks a boss's orders for his first card of the turn. So definitely taking out that Roy Moon EX was the correct play. He's just forced to pass. Sadly, I'm not immediately able to find a switching out off my next turn. But I do attach a Mist Energy to my active, meaning the Blood Moon Ursaluna won't even be able to get KO'd by a Roaring Moon. I just pass it back over to Jake, and then all he does is pass it back to me, and then the game is over with a, another Blood Moon attack from Blood Moon Ursaluna. So we take game number four, leaving us at 4-0 for the tournament. And with that record, we finish in first place. And who knows, maybe in a few days, Arceus V-Star will win the World Championships.